sentences. No need to explain why you did it. Thanks very much. <laughs> well, that made me smile. It probably does you. And it also made me think. It made me smile because I recognised the reality. Professional religious people, priests, they want you to know your need of God and they want you to find ways of accessing him through the sacraments. But if you're persuaded of the value of accessing God through the sacrament of reconciliation, it's a bit rich for the priest to go putting up a notice saying, could you please crack on with it because it's a Saturday and by the way, the premiership late kickoff is on Sky at 5.45. I'm paraphrasing. The notice made me smile, but it made me think too. It made me think about the value, the point of sacramental confession. When people make a confession before a priest, they used to be taught to go through a list of sins, sins of commission and sins of omission, first against God, then against other people, and last against themselves. The first problem one comes up against in doing that is that sins are quite difficult to divvy up. In one sense, all sins are sins against God, and in another sense, all sins are sins against oneself. As someone who's just welcomed a new puppy into the family, I'm newly aware of the need for clear boundaries about behaviour. It's helping me with Phoebe the Beagle to call on my experience of bringing up children. Dogs and children don't understand sometimes. It makes no sense to them if you say, this is sometimes okay, but sometimes not okay. They need clarity, they need boundaries, and so too do Christians. For example, there should be no doubt in our minds on the basis of today's epistle, 1 Peter chapter 3, that gossip and lying are sins, just as adultery and theft and murder are shown by the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, to be unambiguously sinful. Anyone who's tried to raise a puppy or a child will know that boundaries are important. They'll also know that boundaries require constant vigilance to be maintained. And they'll know that children and puppies constantly test those boundaries to see what they can get away with. Not everyone can call on their experience of child rearing, of course, or puppy rearing for that matter. But luckily for me, and the point I'm trying to make, all of us have been children. We remember how we pushed the boundaries, how we identified unerringly the parent who would cave into whining and the one who would not. And we probably also remember how, even as we sought to subvert the rules as they affected us, we were tenacious in upholding them when it was our siblings or our rivals who were disadvantaged by them. If you say to a child or to a puppy, be a good girl, how do they know what you want unless you're specific? You need to say, be a good boy, do this. Be a good girl, don't do that. And that, in very simple terms, makes it easy to see the attraction of lists and codes of rules for behaviour. Listing sins is necessary and it's helpful, but it also carries risks. When I uh, help people to make their confession, I encourage penitents to take time to reflect and I advise them not to go raking through the sludge at the bottom of their well of conscience. It's better, I think, to give the murky water a bit of a poke and a stir and just see what scum floats to the surface. I also advise that if they're ever tempted to miss out a sin, that's probably the thing they most ought to be speaking aloud. It isn't necessary, coming back to the notice, it isn't necessary for penitents to be 100% comprehensive, just so long as we aren't strategically selective. As I mentioned, the most famous sin list for Christians is the Decalogue, or at any rate, the thou shalt not bits of it. If we were doing 1662 full fat instead of semi-skimmed, we'd have gone through all 10 commandments by now. But even the Decalogue isn't comprehensive. It doesn't include every act or inaction which is wrong. The first commandment is the one that really matters. That's the one that picks, that's picked out by Jesus. And the other nine are like a commentary on it. They show how it might work out in practice. For example, it's contrary to the first commandment, the commandment to love God, to cover your neighbour's ass. There are moral and ethical codes in the New Testament too, and this morning's epistle is one of them. Let me remind you. 
He that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Now that passage is not a list like the Decalogue. It only refers to two concrete sins, gossip and lies. For the rest it deals in abstracts, evil, good, peace, righteousness. It's left up to the listener, the reader, the individual in the community to work out in what those qualities consist. The law is a blunt instrument for justice. One can sin egregiously without ever transgressing commandments two to ten. We've all encountered people who've never committed conspicuous sin actively, but who are sunk in sins of omission, failing to love, unwilling to forgive, lacking in compassion. They may not have broken commandments two to ten, but by not actively pursuing the good, to follow on from last time I preached here, by not behaving with active, positive goodness, they've definitely broken commandment one. Consider 1 John chapter 4. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? To come back once more to that church notice about confession. No, we don't need to give reasons when we confess our sins, but that isn't because reasons don't matter. It's because God knows our reasons. Confession is a form of prayer. And as Augustine remarks somewhere, we pray in order to fortify ourselves, not to inform God. Mentioning Augustine reminds me of one more thing I would think it would be helpful to refer to here. A lot of books have been written by him and a lot more have been written about him. But nothing in his theology is more important than the principle which drives it all. For Augustine, motivation is everything. There are corporate aspects to sin. Witness the Psalms of Lament, which are written in the plural. We have sinned with our fathers. We have gone astray and done wickedly. Sometimes we find ourselves in a position which is tragic, in the proper sense of that term, because we're forced to choose not between good and evil, but between one evil and another evil. This is why God judges by our motivation as much as our actions. This is why one can sin without lifting a finger or having a thought if the act of not lifting a finger or not thinking is to the hurt or detriment of someone else. It's a dramatic moment in Luke's Gospel when the huge catch of fish is netted and Simon Peter sees it and falls down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And that does strike me as an odd reaction to a bumper catch of fish. But it's the reaction of a man who knows his own skill, who knows how to catch fish, and who knows how sometimes even skill isn't enough. Simon Peter knows that this catch is somehow not natural, but supernatural. And in this oddly mundane moment, so far from work, walking on water, so easily to be dismissed as luck, Peter sees the truth, the truth of what he himself is and the truth of what Jesus is. And he calls him Lord, ascribing God's own name to him. And he shows us the right response to that. He laments his sin. Just like that publican, also in St. Luke's Gospel, who saw himself for what he truly was, in contrast to the self-righteousness of another man who thought goodness was a matter of following codes, or indeed, going beyond them in conspicuous, God help us, competitive piety. So to come back to that church notice one more time, where sacramental confession is concerned, the rule is all may, none must, some should. And generally, I like the Anglican way of doing regular confession corporately. Tell God what you've done, say sorry, receive the assurance of his forgiveness, and then Go and get on with being a better servant of the servant king. Amen.